and we don't answer the chat. We don't answer so. the chat. I just, I can't follow that. So, so questions in the Q and A. So Dr. Rob, I'm gonna put the first one in the answered so that we can, okay. What do you think about a sex addict being a sponsor when they have not completed the steps? They are 24 months from full disclosure and still on step six themselves. Is it wrong to tell them they must do right by sponsee and stay ahead and complete 12 steps practice with what they preach? Is it wrong to point out that a stranger would motivate him to complete the steps where desire for his own self-recovery or show want to repair the relationship did not? Um, well, you know, either one of us could easily answer that question. So why don't you start, Tammy, with your 12 perspective and I'll go on with my 12 step perspective. So what I'm kind of wondering about is um, wh who are you to this? Is Are you the, the addict or are you the betrayed partner? But so here's where I'm taking it though. Um, it, 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 right or wrong, like it's not, I mean, is it helpful at the end of the day? Um, when we look for a sponsor, I, I, I want somebody who is ahead of me in the steps. Um, knows what they're guiding me through, has solid information. They, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it. So it's one of those where you look for somebody that has what you want rather than, you know, is just going to go, sure, you don't need to say that. Oh, you don't need to, don't press yourself for that. So, so it really is, it's more about, you know, what I'm looking for. And if I'm looking for really doing the steps, really having freedom from my addictive behaviors, I'm going to look for the best sponsor I can find to help me help guide me through the process. So, so it, it, telling somebody else, they typically are not, um, they don't, they don't care to hear the message. So um, it's more about, you know, is this person getting what they need to be able to move forward in recovery? Well said, Tammy. Um, let me see what I can add. So there, I think there's a number of questions in here or comments. There's a little bit of energy in here, as you will. So, and then the person, I don't know if you saw them, they chatted that they are a spouse. So- oh, um, No, I didn't see the chat. So yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I'm gonna walk a delicate balance, but also be responsible to the 12 step beliefs that I hold. Um, I don't think it's anyone else's job to tell me how to run my program whether I should work on my first step, my fifth step, whether I should sponsor or not, that is not my, that is not your job. That is not my spouse's job. I don't care how angry, how disappointed, how much they want to, am I going to meetings? I think that's important for you to know. How often do I go? You should know that because those things will reassure you within our relationship that I am working on it. But how far along I am, what I'm doing there. Did I choose a sponsor? Would someone else sponsor me? Honestly, I wouldn't say those things to my spouse because I can, I really think what happens in the meetings is about what happens in the meetings. Um, to technically answer your question, I wanna uh, agree with Tammy, which is I just need to find someone who's further along than me. And if someone's been there a week and they've stopped cheating on their wife, then they're further along than I am. So there really is no uh, rule, if you will, on you have to finish the steps in order to sponsor someone. Now, that being said, 24 months from full disclosure and this person is still on step six, so that's not your issue to deal with because it's not a spouse's job or a friend's job or even a therapist's job to say, you need to be doing this in your program. We need to tell you to go and it's important that you're involved and we want you to be active in the process. But as I said, what we're doing in there with the folks we're working with is really our thing. However, it concerns me greatly that this person doesn't seem to be doing what they should be doing. And so I separate out, um, Oops, somebody came to visit us. Who's Bye, that? Scott. Bye, Scott. Scott, you're on our webinar. Go away, Scott. We care about you, but go away. Let me, I can get rid of, oh, there we go. He, he logged into my account inadvertently. So anyway. Okay, well, that's okay. So just so they know, um, we use different accounts too. So there are other free groups and other active groups going on on our site. And that's someone who dropped in to do a different group than the one that we're running. Um, so, uh, that's how this person ended up on the screen, but they do work with us and they're, you know, yes. they're not like just some person who showed up. Um, but I'm going to text, text them. Yeah, please yeah. text them. I'm going to mute. Um, oh, he wrote us. I see. Okay. Someone is running. You can see what he wrote. I think 
you've in the I think you wrote it in the chat here. Um, let me just continue to answer the question, which is I Tammy, did you want stop me to stop or do you need to go do something? I'm sorry, you get muted. You go. I'm gonna call Scott. Okay, bye. Um, so Tammy's trying to cover a group that probably someone wasn't able to cover and they weren't able to go and because we have multiple groups going on at the same time. So in any case, I am concerned about the lack of work going on here. I am also concerned that somehow a spouse is involved in what somebody is doing in their 12-step program. And I don't think that you need to be in any particular place other than involved and engaged and a little bit further along than the person you're helping in order to sponsor them. And by the way, I would say to all of you that sponsorship is, a, is service and doing service while it is in the steps and further along, doing service is only going to make me feel like a better person. As long as I'm not lying or pretending I know things that I don't know, doing service, you know, giving something to other people is always going to make me feel better than it does them. So if this is someone who's willing to help someone out, I mean, sponsor means answer the phone, help with questions, guide them through their steps. If they, this person is uh, willing to do that or your spouse is willing to do that for someone else, I think that's a gift. Um, so I would say stay out of his program, ask him about other things, <laughs> but what step he's on and what he's doing there is really his business. Um, do, you want to, uh, do you want to read the next question, Tammy, or are you back? back? Go ahead and you read it. I need to handle a little situation and then I'll be back. So, so okay, if you please read Tammy it, does. I put it in answer. She answers, she handles situations that Sotami does. So um, I think a gentleman wrote, I'm a male addict in recovery with a full seven day a week schedule, including psychoeducation, podcasts, couples podcasts, webinars, therapy with a CSET and groups. By the way, I didn't hear 12 step groups, so I don't know what groups are. I recently came across and heard about DBT. I asked my therapist and they said they can start that with me in the next few weeks. What exactly will this entail and what are the ins and outs and goals to expect with DBT? Are the particular areas that my, I myself should focus and steer toward? Okay, I'm gonna uh, give an answer that, um, that I, so let me back up. A lot of times therapists will call me and they'll say, can you tell me more about DBT? I'm thinking about working with that with an addict. And I will say, gee, I don't know much about that, but go online and Google DBT and addiction, and you will find endless articles, endless books. So I would say go online and look, and you will find so much more information. I'm not a DBT therapist, and I, and that's not the format that we use um, in our treatment, although it's interesting. I talked to a gentleman. We've been so busy. I wanted to bring on another therapist, and he does a lot of DBT. Um, DBT is, is uh, I, I suggest you look it up. It's more complicated than I can really talk about, but the process is useful to addiction. What I like about what this therapist said to you is they may be able to start that in a few weeks. And what they're telling me is you have some basic things to do around recovery and you know whatever it is you need to do to clean up the mess you're in right now before he can really go on to DBT. So I appreciate that he's not like, let's start with that. But I think it is a reasonable way of working with addicts. I, I don't think it's uh, out of uh, what many people do. It's just not a particular form that I work with. Um, and I would want to make sure, by the way, that the groups you're going to are 12 step. Not that going to a therapy group is a bad thing, but I want to make sure you're going to meetings um, because there is nothing else like being around those people like us. Um, okay, I'm going to go on to the next question. I, I'm back. So, okay. I see. So, oh. is, is there a specific order for recovery or is it all handled at once when there are multiple addictions, sex, porn, food, et cetera, multiple disorders, OCD, CPTSD, anxiety, et cetera, and trauma from severe forms of abuse, physical, sexual, emotional? Well, first, I want to say I'm so, so sorry that all of that has happened to any human being. Um, both struggling addiction is hard enough. Having mental health issues is hard enough when you add abuse to that. I'm always can't believe people can walk and talk and chew gum at the same time after been through all of that. Um, I can say one thing that is definitive, which if, if there is a substance abuse, if someone's using drugs or drinking, all bets are off for working on trauma, all bets are off on working for, on sexual issues because you have to have a certain degree of impulse control. You need to be able to say, no, uh, I'm not going to go eat that food. No, I'm not going to go to that strip club. No. So all the behavioral addictions require your head being clear enough. You know, I don't, I don't drink, but if I, I remember drinking and if I had a few drinks, 
well, I can remember saying, I'm not going to do that tonight. And a few drinks later, we're like, you know what? Let's go do that tonight. And so my ability to make other choices than go do my addiction is impaired by drugs and alcohol. And that means I have to handle those first or at the same time. Um, these are difficult questions because um, the, if your goal is to stop acting out, all of these issues, whether it's looking at past trauma or dealing with mental health issues can trigger your anxiety, your stress level and lead right back to acting out. So I, the question you're asking, I think is really best handled with a professional who knows you really well, because you know, which next step you take really is often best determined by somebody who knows what they're doing. And by the way, Tammy often makes referrals. Um, we don't get kickbacks, but we know good therapists pretty much around the country because we've both been all over the country working with people, teaching them. So it is Tammy, T-A-M-I at SeekingIntegrity.com. Um, she's glad, or we're glad to refer you someone who might be able to manage all of this. Um, let me say one more thing, which is there are people who are unable to stay sober on drugs and alcohol and then look at sex or who work on trauma and they end up drinking again. Or And there are some people who simply need to be in residential treatment. And this is one of those reasons. Um, this is a not unusual for us to get somebody in treatment who has enough issues going on out there that they can't, they start working on one and the other one pops up and then they start working on that and they get overwhelmed by this. And they may need to be in a safer environment where they can work on all of it, but not have the sex and the drugs and the gambling all available to them. And so it's people who have addictions that are real closely tied to trauma or mental health issues, and they all kind of reinforce each other. That That is often a case that I think will do well in residential um, treatment. Um, and I would certainly want to be involved with a psychiatrist in these, this circumstance. So hopefully that, Tammy, did you want to add anything? Well, I just, like with that level of complexity, you being in a safe place, which residential treatment to, to be able to safely cocoon you and unpack all of this. And, and for some people, the, you know, the mental health issues are, um, at, are more severe first and, and then addressing the, the addiction issues. Sometimes, you know, stopping the drinking or chemicals is absolutely imperative too. But, but to me, this is like one when somebody reaches out and starts talking about this kind of, uh, you know, I really hope that, that we can help them find a good fit for a residential program to address all of those things. Like Dr. Rob said, you know, a psychiatrist, particularly someone who has the addiction background and, you know, so they're able to unpack what is addiction, you know, because the anxiety, I mean, there's some stuff that just plain goes with it, addiction and stopping and everything else too. So, you know, so understanding all of that and uh, helping regulate, you know, as will be effective, but not interfere with the ability to get into recovery. So, and so hopefully that's helpful. Do reach out to me if I can be of help. So, okay. So next one, how often do you suggest an addict attend 12-step meetings? My SAPA husband of 18 years is in once a week therapy, he attends a 12-step meeting once a week, and I don't feel like that's enough. One to bend for me, so. Well, uh, so there's mixed things here, right, Tammy? I mean, one yes. thing to say, as we said before, is um, you can't tell him what he needs to do. You can't say you need to be in three meetings a week. What you can say is I would feel a lot more comfortable if you were doing these things, because the minute you stick that finger out and you say, do this, the, you know, the, the thing I want to think about is no, I don't care what you say. Um, but if you tell me how you feel, you know, I don't feel safe uh, with your not going to more meetings and I would feel much better if you were, I think then it's, do they respect you? Are they willing to support you rather than they, they got to do what you tell them, so to speak. But as far as once, so if it were me, no, um, I, I can see going to therapy once a week, but it also depends by the way, um, SAP, I would wonder how long, how long this person has been working on it too. Because if I, I have to tell you, I spent many, many years in meetings and I don't go as often as I did at all the way I used to, you know, I used to go to three or four meetings a week because I had to. Now, not so much because I think my life has in many ways moved on, although certainly those thoughts are in my head and I still need to get that support. So, you know, if he's been going to meetings for eight years, um, okay, this person just jumped and said seven months sober, three meetings a week. <laughs> Minimum. Minimum. And here's, here's what I'm reading. I'm like, 
my husband of 18 years has been acting out sex and porn. Um, and he is trying in a 50 minute session once a week and a 12 step meeting. And, and I know this was a snippet, but I don't hear. And he's talking to his sponsor every day and he's been working the steps and he's on step you know, 12 or I'm wherever he is in the process, you know, I don't hear any of that. And just parking your tush in a meeting once a week <laughs> is not going to be, I went, you know, I went to 10 meetings a week because I had time and like all of the time that he's not acting out with uh, or thinking about acting out, planning, acting out that, you know, like time is a, uh, is a problem for us and engaging in healthy activities. I often say, if you use as much energy on your recovery as you did on your acting out, you are going to do great. And I bet he spent more than, you know, an hour and 50 minutes every week thinking about planning or whatever, um, you know, in his active addiction. The other thing is here's, you know, not to be punitive or whatever. I love what Dr. Rob was saying about, you know, for my safety, I want to see more. I want to see, but, but from an addict standpoint, you know, you don't have the tools to use to live life differently. Dr. Rob and I have done our work. We can live life differently. I don't need to be in 10 meetings a week anymore. I don't skip meetings. Either. And if she it's, did, I yeah. couldn't tell her that just to say yeah. it's Co her correct. program. <laughs> but yeah. And, and if I was feeling like I needed more support, I would go to 10 meetings a week. I, you know, like it, it, but I gained all the skills to live life differently, you know, by doing the work that I did, I've laid a foundation. Dr. Rob has too. So we have a reservoirs to draw on and we go, Oh, we need a little bit more. So we lean in or we just, I mean, I go to meetings just cause I like to go to meetings now too. It's like, but you know, I always gain something. So, so he's not got the freedom from the promises do come true, but we have to do the work. And he doesn't have that yet. He's probably just more or less not acting out, which, you know, is a reward of itself, but you don't have the freedom, the serenity, the peace. He doesn't have a partner who's going like, you know, oh, shoo, I can feel that he's really changing. And I would invite him for his own serenity to engage more deeply in the process. I love when we say that, Tammy, I'd invite them, which means you better go F and do it or you're going to have yeah. to save your life. But, you know, we, we I are still polite. balk. No, I still balk at the, if I get told what to do, I, I, I still know that my first reaction is going to be dig my heels in, you know, no. even if it's good for me. Yeah. I would rather have it be, you know, you have a choice in this, you know, like you, you can be miserable. I, you know, it's up to you. You can be right. miserable and rotten, or you can have serenity and peace. I'll be, thank I'll take serenity and peace. Thank you very or much. Or maybe it won't work for you. It worked for me, but it's not my yeah, job. To exactly. Tell you what to do. Yeah. I think that the founders of the, we're Trump older, were brilliant we have... in the, you know, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, you don't, you don't have to do this, you know? So, okay. Ready for the next one? And we yes, are older. My spouse of over 10 years left a few months ago, continues to act out um, as we are separated. I'd like an answer as to if we can get divorced or if he'd like to work on our marriage. He's not ready to make a decision. Does this mean it's time for me to move on with my life? I love him and built my life and dreams around him, but I also want to be safe and keep my uh, little children safe. Well, I, I, I stop with little children. I mean, that just, you know, that's when I think about not only the choices that you're making for yourself, but how are your kids going to experience uh, a dad who comes and goes. How are they going to experience a dad who is leaving you feeling vulnerable and unsafe? Um, so that's just where my head went is what are they experiencing? What are they seeing? What's it like in that house when he's there, when he isn't there, you know, when things are going well and they're not because they see everything. They see everything. And we know because we see them 15 years later in treatment. Um, but, um, and I'm, by the way, I'm very, very sorry for your situation. I don't think what I feel like is someone is holding hostage you're being held hostage to someone else's decisions. And I would I don't like being in that. I, and so I guess what I would ask you to do is to find your own power in this. Um, is it time for you to move on with your life? I don't know. What, is it acceptable for you 
that this person left and that they're still acting out and that they're not sure if they want to stay or not. Forget about whether they're going to get divorced or not. What makes you, what makes sense to you? What feels right? I'm not saying, you know, don't love, don't dream. You know, I love people who've passed away and I adore them and we had dreams together, but they're not here anymore. And sometimes people go in and out of your life. You know, I've met, uh, we've had a lot of people at Seeking Integrity, a lot of men who realized or their spouse did that they just wanted to co-parent, that they were much better friends when he could do what he wanted and she didn't have to worry about it, but together they could take, really love those children. So, um, and again, he's not ready to make a decision. What do you want? Do you want to sit around and wait? Again, Tammy and I said, no judgment. Or do you want to take, but, but it will produce more anxiety and discomfort because you're putting your life in someone else's hands and letting them make decisions. Or are you saying, I want to wait six months, or I would like to get a lawyer and see what it looks like, but I'm not going to do it. Or, you know, or I don't want you coming. You know, you, there are many things you can do between divorce and where you are. You could do a formal separation. You know, you could divide up your money. I mean, it's not unusual for us to work with a spouse who says, I'm not sure whether I want to be with you or not, but I'm going to do a formal separation. So my finances and everything is in order. And I hope that we're able to go forward. I don't know. So I would ask you to do what feels safe for you. And as Tammy would say, to protect those kitties. And, uh, and then, you know, it doesn't matter so much what he wants. What matters is what you want. And if what you want isn't available or you can't have it, then you grieve. That's what we do. Um, but you can't make him into someone that he's not. And you can't fit your life into a situation where everything's. And it's not just you who's on hold. Your kids are on hold. You know, maybe they could be in a much better set of service. Anyway, I got it. I, I think you need to find your own heart and soul in this as a mother and as a woman. Um, and that has nothing to do with him. So Tammy, as a woman, you might have a different perspective. So please let me toss it to you. I'm going to be a little more, um, uh, I, I, if you haven't talked to a divorce attorney, please do so. I just get the information, whether you choose to act on it or not, you do. You, you have got to protect you and your children. So, so I strongly encourage you, knowledge is power. Make sure you understand what it looks like. Because I think so many people... Um, you know, are going like, well, I don't want to do it because it's going to be this, and but you don't know. And so every state is different. Every situation is different. So just understanding what it's going to really look like. We have a lot of clients that come to treatment because their spouse has said, I can't keep living in this space. And so, you know, I, I want to co-parent with you. I, I, you know, I ultimately envision a, a relationship with you, but this is not safe for me, for our children right now. So our choices are we separate, we get a divorce, whatever you choose, or you go get help. And I'm willing to stick around for a period of time while you get help and see what that looks like. Again, not saying that's right for you. That may be, that may not be, um, but you getting support. I'm so glad you're here. You know, hopefully you're leaning into the betrayed partner groups that are on sex and relationship healing.com as well, so that you're getting support. I, uh, I, I did a, a grieving webinar series with Debbie McRae the last two Fridays. And, and we talked about, you know, you, you know, when you know, and I think it really is when, when your head, like, like you can have head knowledge, but it hasn't gone to your heart. Like you're still going, you know, I want good things for him and things like that. But, you know, at some point, sometimes it goes from my head to my heart. And I know, you know, it's like, then you're able to really discern, but getting support and guidance you know, looking at pros and cons, understanding all aspects of it so that you're making a decision and not reacting, I think will serve you well. So can I add one thing, Tammy, mm -hmm. um, because we didn't um, this concrete information. He left a few months ago. He continues to act out. Do you want to live with that person? Do you want to live with someone who would, would rather move out and do what they continue to do? They're not moving out to get themselves together. You know, they're moving out to do what they want to do without you hassling them. And maybe they're moving out because something's going on out there that they want to pursue. My bottom line is that this person is acting like an active addict and leaving you in the dark. And so I know if I expect an addict, what I expect of an addict is they're going to do what's best for them. They're going to, if they can put me off so they can decide this person, that person, this situation, that they'll do it forever. And so that's what I think we're saying about you have to take control of your own life back, even if it hurts, because you can't be led around by the nose. You've already 
been led around by the nose by this person who's acting out and lying to you, it, it's really a matter of even if it hurts, you have to take your life back, whatever that means to you. And I ultimately hope he gets help because he can't be the best dad to those kiddos as Dr. I, he can't, you know, he can't be, you know, um, but, and they deserve, you know, they deserve, but they've got you and, you know, you will love them. They will be fine. They won't, you know, it isn't automatic that everybody turns into an addict where they don't, they have loving, caring, nurturing, you know, support you know, that they can be very fine. So, okay. Next question. What are some reasons why one would fantasize about having sex with strangers? Oh my goodness. That's a loaded question, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I'd be curious whether they're talking about a man or a woman, um, because I think people have different fan in part, gender does influence the kinds of fantasies we have and, and how often we have them and all that kind of stuff. Um, I fantasize about both is. But here's the thing. Uh, I think that, I think that there, that most people <laughs> fantasize about having sex with strangers all the time. And, you know, oh, that person's cute. I wonder what that would be like. It doesn't have to be a, a full on fantasy all the way to, you know, doing the act simply looking at someone and saying, oh, they got a cute butt as a healthy person, not as an addict, you know, might flash through their head. I wonder what it would be like to have sex with them. I don't think that's unusual or unhealthy. Now, what we do is we pursue them. We try to get their number. We think, oh, I want to go do that. I'll find someone else to do it with. You know, we, we do all kinds of things with that fantasy. But the fact is people have all kinds of fantasies what do they do? That's what I'm interested in. You know, I, I, I think, and Tammy, I had this discussion and I want you guys to hear this. For those of you who know what a bottom line or an inner circle is for our addicts, um, the, the bottom line or the inner circle means these are the things that mean I had a slip. I have broken my commitment in my sexual sobriety. So it would be like as an alcoholic, I drank or as a gambling addict, I went to the casino. Some folks some spouses will say, well, I want you to put lying, for example, in the middle of that circle, because if you lie, you're acting out. I will say that while I would never want you to be lied to, and it is a big warning sign for us if we are lying to you, it's not the same as us going to have sex with strangers. It's not the same as the alcoholic having a drink. And if we can't have the grace to do it imperfectly, as long as we're staying sober, then you don't want to put things in that bottom line that people do you know and I might lie to Tammy about how weird her eyes looked the other day when they were doing surgery but it doesn't mean I'm going to give up my sober time and so in the same way you know no one can control their fantasies that is you know and boy the way the more you try the more you'll have so um, I wouldn't judge someone on what goes through their head um, or myself I, I am curious what people's actions are and, you know, have they ever acted on that? Have they, have someone I care about ever acted on that? Have I ever acted on that? Um, because there are lots of reasons why people, people have all kinds of fantasies and I don't judge them unless they're acting out in a way that hurts them or others. So. I want to, I want to ask you a question to elaborate on, because you said people can't control their fantasies. And I think That's you true. can start having a fantasy and then you can do something to so, so can you talk yes. about that? Because like just going, well, I can't control it and spending two hours fantasizing. Well, I can, they say in all, almost all the 12, pro, 12 step programs, if you think you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, take an opposite action. So, you know, if I don't think it's a good idea for me to be fantasizing about someone, first of all, the first sign is I'm going to notice that I'm fantasizing, right? Or that I really want to. So that's what I meant is I can't take, I see someone on the street, I find them attractive, I have a fantasy. I, I don't think there's much I can do about that. But what do I do with it? Do I uh, make sure I walk for a while and don't go back to the office? Because when I'm back to the office, I look at porn. Do I pick up the phone and call somebody I, I'm in recovery with? You know, especially if I have a history of going after this kind of behavior. So, you know, we have this thing called the three, uh, the three uh, second rule, which is, you know, I look for a moment, I look away, and then I, you know, I think of them as one of God's creatures or as a mother or as a child. So, you know, there are actions. I think, Tammy, that's what you meant, that you can take once the fantasy occurs, but the fact that we have fantasies, you know, and I've heard people say that, like, I got to get rid of those fantasies. You know, that's like saying, I want to get rid of one of the chocolate chip cookies when I'm looking at, I'm, I'm always going to want to eat chocolate chip cookies. I can't get rid of that desire, but I don't have to eat them. 
So was that an okay metaphor? Yeah, no, that, that, that helped. I want to talk one more thing about this before we leave this, because we did have a long conversation, but the, the lying and, um, you know, partners are going, but the lying is what, you know, I hate and, and it just hurts my relationship so badly. So, you know, how, you know, if, if we say it's not in the inner circle, it's in the middle circle, you know, then we're not resetting a sobriety date, but, but how do we, how do we help partners kind of mentally get there with, you know, yes, it's a problem, but is it, it's not a behavior. How do we help well, with that? I think the issue is control, really. It's one thing to say, you know, I feel uncomfortable when you do this. I feel more comfortable when you do that. But I think it's not unusual for a spouse who loves someone to say, I'm going to try to keep charge of what they think, where they go, what they do, how they do it, because I'll feel safer and maybe we'll have a future. And trying to become someone's parole officer is not going to lead to a loving relationship. They're just going to resent you. And so there are many, you know, we have to give our expectations, but you can't make them happen. You know, it's like the person who said, I don't feel comfortable over this person not working on their seventh step or whatever. You can say, I'd feel more comfortable if you were working on the steps more regularly, but you can't make them do it. Um, and that is what I make my decisions on, not what they say, but what they do. I do want to say something about lying. We have another rule, which is, depending on the person, it's a 24 or 48 hour rule. I will often say to clients, I know you're going to lie to me. You're probably lying to me today. But next time when you come in, I want you to tell me that you lied. And so, and I don't care if you lied, but I want to know that you did. And I say to the same, you know, some of us look at your angry face and we just lie. <laughs> I can't say it another way. You know, we're 50 years old and we've always lied and we, we have trouble with that angry face. And we, the first thing is we lie. And my thought is, fine, you lie, but within by the end of that day or within 24 hours, you need to go back to your partner and say, look, I, I wasn't, I, I was afraid to be honest with you. I'm so sorry. And this is the truth. Um, if they're acting out, they need to tell you sooner. But if they lie about, you know, having spent money on something and they tell you later, I think that's sort of within the bound. None of us is going to do it perfectly. Okay. Next question. I first discovered my husband's infidelity a year ago. Back then, in order for me to stay, we signed an agreement, more like a commitment letter, that was that from day one, we both committed to the marriage. And if any of us um, to be unfaithful to the other, the unfaithful one would lose all of our common assets and children, custody, or Ooh. to the other party. A lot of things came out in the following months. Turns out it was not just simple infidelity. And my husband is in fact a sex addict with a large number of acting out behaviors. He is in 12 steps since September of last year. We have an upcoming formal therapeutic disclosure in about six weeks because I found out more lies three months ago. He has been pushing me really hard recently for canceling the agreement we signed before because he said he is an addict and he could relapse anytime and he does not want to lose anything because of that. Mm, I don't know if they're, hang on, let me go. Um, if there's a, um, well, I think, I there, think, I think there's another that. piece of it. So hang on, this is a long one. Well, okay. I am suspicious he might have done something in between. He is afraid of the consequence if it comes out in disclosure. I told him whatever happened in between, I'm willing to let go. And the agreement we signed only apply after disclosure. Um, and I'm willing to sign a paper for that. Also, I'm considering canceling the agreement if I feel he finally has come to an honest place. But he would not agree and then threaten not to do disclosure. If he had a sleep or, a slip or whatever, he would be... Um, uh, or whatever, but he is he, being honest, honest with me, I would not mind. But if he is using the disclosure to manipulate me in order to cancel the agreement, I would really feel stupid and didn't want to trust him again. Dr. Rob, I really appreciate your opinion on this matter. That's complicated. I can't believe he signed so, that agreement, like, because he knew, like, all this stuff. So that's kind of amazing. I'm just... Well... Yeah, I mean, I, as someone who's a new, I think one of the things about, let me try it this way, when someone's in treatment with us, and they leave, or they're on their way out of seeking integrity, and I say, how are you doing with recovery? How do you think you're, they're, you're going to do? And they say, I think I got this, I'm going to be sober, I don't think that's going to happen, I get what you taught me, I worry about them. <laughs> because the person who leaves treatment says, you know, I'm really scared that this might happen again. And, you know, I don't know if I learned every lesson. And, I feel better that that person acknowledges that this is a lifelong journey. So 
the idea that it makes me uncomfortable that someone say from now on, I'm going to sign this contract. And because I don't think any addict can say that Tammy could drink tonight. <laughs> you know, I could go act out, you know, when I'm done with this call. I mean, I cannot promise you, we really can only promise that we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing and we're being honest and open. But, um, and as much as I know you spouses would like to hear, I'll never do it again. And you do hear that from us. That's not a promise that we can make. Um, so I would never sign an agreement like that as an addict because I wouldn't be sure that I could keep it. What I appreciate about you is that you've shifted. You shifted from if you ever do this or if you do this again to after disclosure, which I think is really, really helpful. But then disclosure got canceled because of more lies. And um, so I so here's what I think. All agreements are off throw them in the garbage because they don't mean anything. He will lie to you. You'll forgive him. You'll move the line. You know, he, he will beg you to, for, you know, it's just going round and round. So I, I don't think, I think you need to decide. Do you want to be with this person and see them through this struggle and realize that they're going to slip and realize that you're on a journey with this person for a couple of years before they really become the person you'd always wanted them to be and that they may never be able to agree that they will never slip again? I mean, in other words, what I hear again is this, and I, I, God bless you spouses, I completely understand it, but it's this desire for a control and a promise because you don't want your heart broken again. Neither would I. But if you're with an addict, there are no promises, there are no guarantees, and there is no perfection. So um, down to the question, um, if he's using the disclosure to manipulate me in order to cancel our agreement, I would feel really stupid. Um, I don't, disclosure isn't something you use. <laughs> disclosure is something you set a date for and you do it. And so this whole idea that, and in this side doesn't make sense to me, we have an upcoming disclosure in about six weeks because I found more lies. Okay. And then he wants you to cancel that. I, I don't, anyway, I, again, I find this, this is a lot of stuff, but I would not put my relationship on, um, on how the, I don't know how to say, Tammy, can you jump in there? I well, like there's so much in there. It's really toward the end, I think. Yeah, but I, yes, I would not base all of my relationship on the disclosure. Um, so I think part of it is what are you seeing him doing? And I hear he's, it sounds like he's getting, you know, cold feet and going, oh, oh, oh you know. I'm going to um, run to the restroom. I'll be right okay. back. Okay. But to me, it, 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 I, I think hold the line on disclosure that you're waiting to see more, you know, how the agreements go or not go. I mean, I, 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 there, you guys could get all tangled up in, in legal stuff. And, you know, I signed under duress or I don't even know, but I'm not an attorney. I'm not, don't take anything I say as any kind of legal um, anything. However, you know, if, if, well, no, the purpose of a disclosure is to build a foundation, uh, you know, for the relationship to move forward. You know, if, if both of you are committed to that process that you are working on having this be so that you can move forward in a different way based on different, you know, different behaviors. You know, he's been a sex addict for a long time. More has been revealed. You deserve to have that, you know, to set the foundation. And if both of you go into the disclosure, you know, the formal therapeutic disclosure with the idea that this is going to set a foundation for, you know, for the next chapter of our relationship and eyes wide open, we're going to, to work on navigating this, then, you know, then dealing with the, the legal stuff that you signed or didn't sign or whatever, you know, that can absolutely be, you know, future stuff. I, I would, I would try to hold the, we're focusing on this because we want to have a foundation of recovery on which to build. That's my thought. Yeah. And I, I want to thank you, Tammy, because this is a lot here. And the other thing that um, I think is not being said is um, if I, and I say this to spouses all the time, you want to, you're welcome to say, I'm going to leave you if this happens again, I'm going to leave you if you break this contract, I'm going to great leave you if you don't do this or that. But I got to tell you, and I'm pointing my finger now, if you say you're going to leave me, you better leave me. Because what you're doing is moving the line. Well, he asked this, and then I, we were this, and then I changed the contract. Do you know what we addicts learned from that? Is that we can do whatever you want. 
because you're not, you're, we can manipulate you into changing the bottom line. This man has manipulated you into changing the original agreement, into pushing off disclosure. You know, um, I, I just think that, you know, you have a right to say, I want disclosure within three weeks and I don't care what you've done or what you haven't done or I need to know. And that may mean that I'm going to stay or go. I don't know. And it's fine to say, I don't know. But once you say, I'm going to do this, you better do it because we learn from that. And I know that all you spouses want to say, I'm crossing my arms now. If you ever do this again, I understand that. Lord knows who wouldn't want that. But we really do have a mental health disorder. And I'm not making an excuse. I'm just saying that it can flare up under a lot of stress and a lot of, you know, if we're not taking care of ourselves. So I'm not making any promises to anyone that I'm going to do anything forever. Um, what I can promise is I will tell you if there's an issue. But this putting it off and changing it and putting it off, I think that's what confused me. Is like there wasn't just a straight line to this is what we agreed to do. This is what we're doing. For some reason, the, what do you call it? The thing got moved. Um, it got moved. The finish line got moved. Yeah, they moved the, you moved the finish line and then it makes everything really confusing. So stick to your guns, pick a date, go forward no matter what he says, and then you'll know what to do next. Yeah. Oh, My also children. threatening. Yeah, it's, yeah. Don't threaten. There's no point in threatening. Ask her what you want. You get it or you don't. I'm sorry. Right. Ben. Well, no, and I think it's my bound this is my boundary you know we're going to do this and it doesn't then it takes the you know the intensity of the finger pointing and all of that the fighting out of it it's like this is you know this is what we've agreed to do we're going to move forward with this i'm prepared you know for my part of the disclosure i've got my support in place da, 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 you know whatever but this is this is what we're gonna do now the only caveat to that is if his therapist you know, it, like, and this has happened where he hasn't done his whatever, but that's more data for you. I mean, if he is, you know, dragging his feet and not doing what he needs to do, which is different than he's trying really hard and he's just struggling to get, you know, the, like the pieces in place or whatever. So, so, um, but hopefully that's helpful. Okay. Next that question. Good. We did good. Okay. My children are 9, 11, 13, and 20. My SA husband has always had a mental illness and sex addiction. I also have a history of depression. However, the last five years have been the worst on our family with the last year and a half since D-Day being, for lack of better words, a total shit show with both myself and my husband dealing with the consequence of discovery. Well, we've gotten better in some aspects with therapy, 12-step groups, et cetera. Our children are also in therapy. I know we are not to tell children about sex addiction. The question is, should we tell the kids therapists so that they know better what the children have been dealing with? If, um, if so, how much should we tell and why or why not? Um, well, I, I can only give a generic answer to that question because I don't know the kids. I don't know the circumstance. There's also a difference between a 20 year old being in therapy and a four year old being. So I'm not sure who's being treated for what, um, you know, that's, but I will say in general that, um, if the therapist that I question for you, they'd ask, you know, um, if they felt that there was also, if there were sexual concerns with the kids, like one of them was saying I was touched here or, you know, dad, someone made me look at something. I didn't know where, you know, if there were reasons to point in that direction um, or one of the kids said to you, you know, something like that, I would call a therapist and say, said the kids said this, or I noticed that when she was with the babysitter, they did that. But I don't see any reason if I was seeing your spouse or anybody for, or your kids for treatment that I would need to know. Um, now, I'd like to know that you guys have problems, that you haven't been getting along, that you separated, that you've been fighting a lot, that, you know, I would even be okay with, um, he might have cheated, and that's part of the, but um, I don't know that it's really that germane to the kids to know what it is that's driving your behavior. They just need to know that you're having it. Yes, they are arguing. Yes, they are unhappy. Yes, there are issues. They need you to validate their reality that things are not good, but they don't need you to tell them the details of why. Now, unless the therapist comes along and says, I want to know, or unless one of the ki kiddos, as Tammy says, would uh, show some sign that th there was concern. So my answer is, you know, I don't know all this situation, but I probably wouldn't um, unless there was a specific reason to do that. And the 20 year old, like you, like they would not be reaching back out as, you know, as parent guardian for the 9, 11, 13 year old, you know, they, they would, but the 20 year old is an adult. So, um, right. Okay. 
All right, next question. Thank you, Dr. Robin Tammy, for taking time out of your day to help us struggling addicts and partners of addicts. I am a 28 year old, young, gay male in early recovery. You mentioned previously that the opposite of addiction is healthy attachment. Three months of sobriety is helping me see how much pain I've been in all these years. I have a very demanding job and this week at work was very stressful and triggering. This past weekend, when I tried to turn to multiple people instead of my porn addiction for support, most of them were unavailable to hold space for me. I know life happens, but that really makes my heart hurt, and I feel so alone, especially when I always make myself available to hold space for others. I am fighting the urge to block every number I have and say, screw everything. <laughs> Hopefully, being in 12-step and recovery communities can help me build up a network of support, but in the meantime, what would you... What would your advice be to someone looking for healthy self-regulate without porn or people? Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being completely honest. And I can completely you know, relate to, I'm always there for people and no one's there for me. And I would have that drama with it. I'm not saying you are, but I'm like, that would have been my drama with it. It's like, you know, I do. So anyway, I, but I love that you're here. Um, so um if I am being of service to others, then I'm not, it's not all about me. So, so even if it's not within the recovery community and there's always opportunities to serve that, but you know, um, what, what can you do to be of service to other people? You know, some people go and volunteer at the Humane Society. Great. Cause then you get to, you know, play with pets and, and help, but, but, but I mean, do something that is meaningful for you, but that also is giving to someone else and do it without like, sometimes like, you know, the um, pay it forward without letting people know, like, you, like they don't even have to know that you did it. You know, I, I'm going to, I, 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 this is embarrassing, but I'm going to, I mean, one of the things I do like to clean up my community is I pick up trash. I'll even pick up dog poop that other people I thought don't you were I can't believe You're it. Still I picking do. up trash? Tim? I do, but no, a litter, litter. Oh, I'm litter. <laughs> yeah, not, but like, like, but, and I, you know, I don't, I can't believe I just said it on this, but anyway, but that's one of those things because it makes my environment look better. And I feel good about me doing that. Nobody else cares, you know, I'm sure, but, but I do. And so what are some things that get me out of me and doing something else. I also spend more time in nature. That's really important to me to be outside and appreciating and visibly seeing, you know, other things. So the more things that I do, um, I have a recovery app, um, Miracles of Recovery that Harriet Hunter journaled, you know, she was on with Dr. Rob. So, so it's one of those things where I do things. I have a plan because I know I disappoint people from time to time and they're going to disappoint me. So I have a backup plan of what am I going to do to make sure I don't get into a funk about, you know, whatever it is and, or, and put my hard earned recovery in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, one guy said that the podcasts that are on sex and relationship healing.com, he said, every time I thought about relapsing, I, I listened to a podcast and I was like, great, you know, great, whatever you need to do. Um, so that you don't, you know, uh, that, that, that righteous resentment and indignation, you know, it feels good in the moment, but it doesn't feel good in the long term. So, so thrilled you're here. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I want to back that up, which is, um, this to me, asking this question is someone who's very dedicated to want to heal and do, showing up here rather, and even talking about the struggle and what do I do and how do I, I mean, these are the kinds of questions and I really want you to hear this. These are the kinds of questions that tell me that you're doing better than anything you just wrote. I don't care if you had three years or two months or sobriety, your spouse would, but what I care about is that you're thinking this way. Um, you're thinking about the future. You're thinking about the past. You're thinking about how to manage your sobriety. You're thinking about relationship. This is the stuff that we are here to do and not just in therapy, but in places like 12 steps. So I, I, in terms of how you're looking at it, I don't know what you're actually happening, but I, I really like what I'm seeing. I wrote five things down because <laughs> that, um, and I don't want to do them in any particular order. Um, but number one is I have a feeling that this brings up more feelings than just about what's happening now. Um, most sex addicts really struggle with abandonment. A lot of us really struggle with 
as kids, we didn't get our needs met. I mean, we clearly put out what we needed like any child and no one responded or they responded in an inappropriate way. So reaching out and not having anyone respond um, would bring up feelings for me of being worthless or aren't I worth somebody answering the phone for? And I, I hear a little victim in there, I got to say, which is worth looking at, which is, well, look at all I do for others and they're not doing it for me. There's a little bit of victim in there, not because of what happened, but because of how you're responding to it. Um, I, uh, you said something, so I'm, I'm going down my numbers here. Oh, number two, I said, first of all, was um, you, it may bring up some feelings in the past and that be a therapy issue. Number two is shit happens. And maybe they couldn't answer the phone and maybe their kids were busy and you know maybe they got sick or you're reading into what uh, someone else does or doesn't do, I think is really more about you. Um, my question would be, do you have a fourth phone number? Do you have a fifth phone number? You know, what is your backup plan? Because um, it's kind of a numbers game sometimes and someone's with their kids and someone isn't feeling, you know, I think for us to gauge our worthiness or are people kind or, you know, th that's a big conclusion for one afternoon when people happen to be busy. Um, it does make our heart hurt when someone doesn't respond. It, it does uh, make us want to run away and block every number, but that's human. Everybody can feel screw it, I'm just gonna, you know, do whatever and and nobody cares. It's what you do, again, what do you do with it? You know, you wanted to act out, understandable. No one responded to you, shit happens. But what choices are you gonna make with that time? Um, what, and this is what Tammy said, and we do this at Seeking Integrity, the guys have a list. Well, if this doesn't work, I do this. And if this doesn't work, I do that. And by the way, I had a sponsor who said that he just, watch movie after movie after movie. like that's what he had to do to, to make sure he didn't go out there um lock the door get in the bathtub you know sometimes it just takes whatever you can do to get you from leaving the house but um you said something i completely disagree with which is how do you get a, how do you really do this without 400 people and the answer is you don't because as you said or someone else this is a disorder of attachment we turn to behaviors and strangers or situations that aren't good to us to fill up the emptiness that we have because we're not connected to people. So you have a choice. You can either connect to people and make it a real effort and not blame them and shame them when they don't show, but just find somebody else, or you can act out, but you can't not do either one because this is a disease of disconnection. So if you're going to disconnect, then you're probably going to act out. So it isn't an it 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 is it is an either or, but it's not a both not both. Um, um, I also wrote what matters, and this is for, what matters is getting through it. It doesn't matter, you know. What, and I think this is a lesson for all addicts: is our feelings feel intolerable. You know, I just can't. And they didn't call, and I have no one to be with, and I'm so overwhelmed that I just got to fuck it. I'm going to go do this. An hour later, you know, if you went for a walk, had a sandwich, you know, looked at TV a little bit, it probably would be gone. Because one of the things that we really need to learn is that urges pass if we sit in them long enough and we do the right thing. So, you know, just because you wanted to go do something doesn't mean that you had to go do it. And I hope that you didn't, because the real lesson in, is not, it is in being able to get through the time when you want to do it. Um, I wrote a couple other things down. Pick a better group of friends something I wrote down, you know, maybe these aren't, maybe your picker is not particularly good and you need to have a better picker. Um, and I would be at meetings watching, gee, who goes out for fellowship? Who goes out with coffee with people? Who sponsors a couple of people? I would be looking, don't look for the loners who are sitting by themselves because they're either easier to approach. It might be loners for a reason. So pick better people. And the last thing is that gay men in particular are, because we're men, it's hard for two, harder for two men to build a relationship because we tend to be a little competitive and want to one up each other and you know want to be right and you know men do a little bit more of this you know antler stuff than sometimes women do. So I would, when you have a man with a man, it is harder to build a relationship because we both want to be right, we both want to be seen. It's a little different. So I think I would, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I'd look for some straight friends. Um, I think just breaking it up and being with different kinds of people and who think in different ways might also really be helpful for you. Um, gay men in the world that we live in tend to have a harder time connecting. It's harder to build friendships. You know, we're not necessarily in church with kids and family. You know, we're not necessarily doing that. So in any case, I would, I would have a very broad spectrum for who 
I want to be friends with. And by the way, here's the good news. As a gay man, you can have a woman as their sponsor. You can go out with a bunch of women. I was going to say that. For a number of years. And I was so grateful to have her because she knew exactly what I went through with men because so did she. I'm sorry. Why don't you go ahead, Tammy? I'm sorry to bust you. No, I was thinking that. I was like, but we women love you guys. I mean, so it doesn't matter. So yeah, like find, find friends they're out there i but i love that you were here and that you weren't i don't want to just say screw this but you're here and and uh and that's great and you got through it and you know what the next time this happens and it will you'll go oh i had a past experience where i got through it and it was hard i'm going to do something a little bit differently to make it a little easier but i got through it so yeah okay so next you ready for the next question yes ma'am D-Day, 14 months ago, formal therapeutic disclosure, five months ago, SA husband is working on recovery. Question, what would you recommend for me to do to work on my anger rage? I don't yell or anything, but my anger is eating me up, consuming my thoughts and gets in my way of healing. I am hurt, sure, but I am far more, by far mostly angry and offended by his choices. I know I didn't cause or deserve what he has done. And that makes me so angry. Mm. Um, what is FTD? I'm sorry, Tammy. Formal, Formal therapeutic Formal... disclosure. Okay. Yeah. It's been five months. I think your expectation of yourself that you're not going to be filled with anger and disappointment and all the time. And I think that's unreasonable. Um, I think that this is what you feel at five months. Um, and it's only been five months, no matter how long it was since you found out the, the beginning of the safety and healing started at the disclosure. And so you've only been out this five months. And if you, you know, one of the things uh, that I say, I wrote this, I wrote this book called out of the Doghouse, a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating. And one of the things I wrote in there is to the men, which is, you know, you think after six months, You give some flowers, you say, I'm sorry, you're going to lots of meetings and that your partner is not going to be angry anymore or they're going to forgive. But what it says in the book is it's a year at least. I think it's 12 to 18 months before you guys really put down that sense of it it lowers and lowers and you're less reactive and, you know, provided we're doing what we need to be doing and we're leaving you feeling safe. But I, 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 and, and I have another answer for you, which is go get angry with a bunch of other women that this has happened to, because, you know, we, we do these uh, support groups for betrayed partners. And I think we have a betrayed partner course coming up. Um, you're not the only one who gets confused by these issues, who doesn't know how to do them. But I will tell you, go to some of those groups and you, you will hear a, a bunch of other men or women, depending on the group you go to say, I hate them. And I feel like I'm going to hate them forever, even though it's been six months or eight months, or when am I going to get over wanting to kill them? And well, it might take a while, you know, and one of the things I hear from spouses a lot is when are things going to go back to normal or when I'm, when am I going to feel normal? And you know, what I say to all of you, and I hate to say it is crazy is your new normal and you're going to be feeling and acting and doing things that you are very different than how you've been in regular life, because this is not regular life. This is crazy making situation. So I think that you have to accept that crazy is your new normal. And that means being offended and being angry and, you know, all that kind of stuff, because um, what did you say? I didn't cause or deserve what he's done. And that makes me so angry. Um, No, you're right. You had nothing to do with what you could have danced on the head of a pin and he would have done what he did. But I guess when it gets to offended, all I can tell you is that um, I don't know your spouse, um, and I don't know whether he is malicious and intended to hurt you, but most of us um, are not bad people, but we're really broken and literally broken into pieces. That's why our program is called Seeking Integrity. It's about putting those pieces back together. So there is a part of me as an addict that will go do whatever I want to do, and I won't think twice about you because I want to go do what I want to do. Um, and that isn't really about you. It's about my craziness. But when I bring it home and you find out about it, it becomes very personal. Uh, And also I would never do that. And I thought I wasn't with someone who could ever do that. Well, the person you were with probably wouldn't do that, but the person they are when they're out there in the world being an addict, all bets are off. So I guess it's more complicated than, than a lot of us would like it to be. It's been six months. I heard this, they're doing the right thing. I should be feeling better. We're all individuals, it's different for everyone. I will say this, if you get to about a year and you're just as angry as you were, and the addict in your life is doing what they need to be doing, 
you know, I would sort of say, well, why haven't I moved off this space at all in a year? Um, because you should be sort of slow. It's a, like a roller coaster ride. It's really big at the top, and then it should slowly slow down. And if that isn't happening, you know, at a year or so, I'd be really, I would be concerned. But at this point, be as angry as you can be. <laughs> um, try not to hit anyone. We'd appreciate that. I have a couple of things to, to tag on. Yes, we do have a Betrayed Partner work group starting in April, and that is on the um, same link that the uh, Out of the Doghouse, Out of the Abandonment Wound, the Inner Child, the Sex Addiction 101, Porn Addiction 101, all are. So so check those you out. I mean, they're but, all, but they're all six weeks for two hours? Is that what they Six week are? for 90 minutes a week, okay. live facilitated. So there, there's a bunch of great support in there. And, you know, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, the you mentioned for the person that was going like, I just wanted to say, screw that. I was like, abandonment wounds, I'm like, totally understand that. <laughs> um, but but for this partner, like, um, I, I posted the link. So on uh, sex and relationship healing.com under the resource tab, you'll find these, this one will be posted tomorrow, but Debbie McCray did two on um, grief and she talked specifically about the anger and she gave practical tools to use to help work through that. Cause, cause I, I know how you feel. I bet rage and, and it's, you know, like, even if you don't say it, you're feeling it and it's just, yeah, it's a horrible feeling but there are things you can do and she shared a number of practical tools to help you know help navigate that and 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 to help you you know be able to to uh, move through the stages and you you know they're not linear and you don't go oh got that one and then you know you never have to experience that again but as Dr. Rob just said you know it's a roller coaster and they'll start softening um, and you will start to be able to say oh I do see you know I do see distance I do see progress and that's you know that's a gift so so check that out i'm sorry we're out of time but i think you'll find that useful too i just want to add one, one other thing to this which is it sounds like this person's being really hard on themselves like my anger is eating me up and i want to get rid of it and i can't heal and this is where your healing is is in this anger right now a lot of us feel like well when i feel like that like better relieved then i'll be in my healing you're in your healing right now anger is like you know cleaning out a wound and you can't heal it unless it gets cleaned out but it hurts like an m like a you know how it yeah. hurts yeah so um give yourself some grace to be angry um and join with other women who are going through this so you're not alone hey tammy it's always fun to do this together nice to see i agree you. it was great to see you and thank you all for the great questions sorry we didn't get to them join us again next week we'll be back um and all the other amazing uh resources the betrayed partner the addicts groups etc on sex and relationship healing.com so all right thanks everybody bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.